This is Auto Line After Hours with John McElroy and Gary Vaslash, episode 571 for September 16th, 2021. How Hyundai is building the future of mobility. Watch Auto Line After Hours live at autoline.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. AutoLine After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, solutions for your journey, and by Borg Warner, propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy efficient world. So, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, as some of you will be aware, there is no John. Um, he's on assignment. So um, because of that, I have two of my journalistic colleagues in strong support of me. We have Nicole Wakeland, who is a freelancer who writes for a variety of publications. Nicole, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Great. And Jeff Gilbert, the voice of WWJ News Radio 950's automotive coverage. Thank you. So how are you guys doing? Doing okay. How well, are you doing, Gary? I'm doing fine. Oh, I am fine. Just back from the uh, lovely Ford Rouge plant where they uh, announced a new investment. So uh, always good when there's a lot of news happening. Yeah, and there's, there's a lot of excitement happening. And um, I want to bring in our guest, um, Ola Beasy Boyle, who is the Vice President of Product Planning and Mobility Strategy for Hyundai Motor North America. Hello, Beasy. Gary. Beasy, thanks for joining us. Happy to be here. So, so I've, I've got to let people know, okay, so basically what you do is you're the one who determines the strategic direction for the company in terms of products and, and what it's up to. Um, you've for had- For Hyundai North America. For Hyundai North America. And, and you've had a remarkable career. And I know that Jeff Gilbert wants to ask you some questions about your background, um, but- but you've got, you've got experience. You you came to Hyundai from Visa. You've got experience in the auto industry, and what I find to be the most fascinating is that you have a Bachelor of Science degree in physics. So that's that's just just incredible. So okay, so so, so give us a, a sense of of what your your daily chores are like, doing product planning and mobility strategy. At Hyundai North America. Well, thank you for the question. You know, um, it's it's one of the most fun jobs that I've had, and it's fun because I get to, uh, with my team, decide for Hyundai North America what are we going to do with respect to electrification and mobility. At the same time, what do we have to do to plan our products to be the most competitive in North America and also um, have revenue and pricing that's competitive and volume and market share increases? So those those four areas. And so kind of my day uh, starts out with um, we have a very close leadership t team um, that led by our, our, our CEO, Jose Munoz. And we get together in, the, in a, always every Monday morning to talk about where we stand in each of our respective areas. And that's really continued even through COVID. And um, so after we do that, the team then goes off in their respective areas and we get to decide what are we doing from electrification for battery EV, for hydrogen um, fuel cell? What are we going to do for our new products and launches that are coming out? We've had a product onslaught over the last year or so. And how are those going? What do we have to do? What are the, the latest um, items? And how are we most competitive from an EV perspective and a new mobility solution perspective? And I guess that tees up my question. You left the auto industry for a while, as, as Gary mentioned, and you came back. So does that give you a fresh perspective? What made you decide to come back? Had you always planned for that to be just, you know, like students call a gap year or two? Uh, but uh, talk about that, because I, I think you've got a really fascinating resume. Well, you know, I, I worked at Ford for eight years in 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 uh in and started out at the plant at Wayne Assembly, and um, you were talking about uh, Ford Rouge a little bit earlier, and um, then went to Chrysler and I was the chief engineer for the minivan, and so I ended up having um, twenty years um, in manufacturing and product development in auto, 
and I loved it. You know, the the auto game is a is a glamorous game, and um, one of the 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 things that sparked the move is actually my husband, who also worked at Ford for twenty years, um, got an opportunity with one of the electric vehicle startups that was here in California, but Northern California, I'm in Southern California now. And so after 20 years, he wanted to come out and take that opportunity. And I thought I would take off a couple of months, right? And then work at one of the electric vehicle startups and sort of learn this, this electrification piece that we hadn't shared in when we were in, De in Detroit. And then Visa called and, and I thought, what, 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 they don't make cars. <laughs> and so uh, I was a little caught off guard and they said, well, you know, we want to have an opportunity to look at um, connectivity and in-car payments and, and digital virtual cards in the car. But we have a tough time actually talking with some of the tier one players and talking with some of the automakers. And so I thought it would be a way to actually use my background, but learn new things about tech, fintech, and all of that. And you had to learn about AI and tokenization and um, internet of things to understand how all this worked. So I actually worked there three and a half to four years and actually got an opportunity to work with um, some of the tier one suppliers and bring on some of the OEMs to sort of uh, 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 further the in-car payment discussion. And so that was great. And to be honest, I was having a good time. I had no intention of going anywhere. And then, and people had called during that three, four years. And, um, but it was really intriguing with Hyundai because they, their, their global perspective and their very progressive vision and North Star was exceptionally appealing to me. And it said, I would take what I learned in FinTech and AI and IoT, plus what I knew from the car background before, combine those at this moment in time when we're at an inflection point in the auto industry. Because I feel with the auto industry, with our, 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 our process and manufacturing background and, and expertise, but also now the opportunity to transform how people are going to move from A to B in the future is such an opportunity. And we are the best industry to sort of combine those and decide how people are going to move from A to B going in the future. We've got EVs, AVs, fuel cell EV, battery EV. All of this is just going to determine in 10, 15 years from now, different ways of how we get from A to B. And then the business models that go through that, it just is transformative. And our leadership with Jose uh, Munoz as our HMA CEO, but also our chairman with this progress for humanity vision is just gonna, it was just really appealing to me. And that's why I came back. And I am so excited to be part of the auto industry now in this very significant inflection point. Nicole. Yeah. Okay. So I want to know how you went from a bachelor's in physics. Like, what did you think you were going to do with a bachelor's in physics that you ended up at doing engineering for automotive? Right. So growing up, I, I grew up till I was 10 in Lagos, Nigeria, then came to the States and grew up in Harlem in New York City. And I started college at 16. And wow. one of the things that I wanted to do for sure was, um, uh, I, I sort of liked math and science more than I liked reading <laughs> and writing. Okay. <laughs> and so at that point, and my father was an engineer, um, you know, many, many years back. And um, so I, I remember my, 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 my mom was saying, well, you have that aptitude because your father's an engineer and, um, you know, you need to go to college and then get a good job and um, be able to, you know, support yourself and you need to major in something that is good. So that science stuff sounds good. <laughs> so I was good at it. I was told that that's what that I should go to. And I liked it. Right. So I started out in, in, uh, um, in, in physics at Fordham University in New York City. And they have what's called a 3-2 engineering program with Columbia University. And you get two bachelors of science degrees, one in engineering, one in physics. And um, then um, I worked for two two years um, at a company called GTE, which is now Verizon. And then when we went back for our master's, that's where I met my husband at Columbia, we got a master's in mechanical engineering. So now I got a master's in mechanical engineering. Lots of people tr uh, tried to hire you. I ended up working for IBM in tech. But we had gotten these masters in mechanical engineering and I wanted to get my hands on something. You know, we were doing a lot of software and, and, and EE, electrical engineering type work. And I wanted mm -hmm. to 
get my hands on something. So both of us got jobs at Ford and um, started there. And I didn't realize how you, you sort of fall in love with the auto industry. It's a very glamorous industry. I mean, it's a tough industry. <laughs> um, it builds character, I, I say. Um, but you, I got enamored with the industry. And um, so I started out in the plants. I worked at Wayne Assembly, um, Ford Focus at the time, and then eventually moved to product development. Um, uh, and then um, actually then, you know, you guys are, some of you are in, in Detroit. so. Uh, you have Ford, Chrysler, and, and GM, and so uh, Chrysler sort of took me from from Ford, and um, I worked there for twelve years, and I got the opportunity to be the uh, chief engineer for the um, uh, minivan that before Pacifica when it was Town and Country and, yeah. um, and and Dodge Grand Caravan, and I really just grew up in that and loved it. And once you got into the auto industry, I mean, one of the things that that I, I say and I remember that I, I love is when you, when I, when you're was chief and you have your body, chassis, interior, electrical team, and body wants to uh, say that in the sheet metal, the hole needs to go here, but interior wants to say that the, you know, we're putting the fastener here and, and then the trim part's not gonna, and then the next couple of months or whatever, you're driving behind the vehicle where you, you remember that conversation and you remember like the tail lamp is there. You get to see the, the value of your work. You get to see all the decisions that are made. It's an exciting place to be. And, the, and why it makes it even more exciting now is add all of that kind of on the hardware side and then add it to what we, we're going to do when we bring software and tech and we move from EV to, a, to autonomous vehicles, um, both battery and fuel cell what that's going to bring. And then the future and the vision that it can have for, for, for daily lives back to our North for our North goal for progress for humanity. So now maybe in the future, we're going from our urban air mobility vehicle that's powered by fuel cell. It lands at a small airport. You transmit to a ride hailing EV that's also autonomous. It takes you downtown and you go to your E scooter or your E bike to go the remainder of the last mile. And you have some business service that generates revenue for someone that actually ties all of those together. Maybe you own the EV, maybe you subscribe to the EV. Maybe when you go to LA, you subscribe to everything. Maybe when you're in Ann Arbor, you own your particular vehicle, but it's going to say how we're gonna live in the future. And so we're at that inflection point to make it happen. It's just a great time. So, so let me bring it back to. I'm oh, sorry. Now. Okay. No, no. This is great. I mean, I, I mean. So, I mean, I look at, I look at Hyundai as, is basically two parts. I mean, one is the today and what you guys are doing, which I think is, is rather remarkable, and the other is the vision for the future that you have, which is even perhaps more remarkable. I right. mean, um, and okay, you know, I, I was looking at, at at sales numbers. I mean you guys are still selling cars. I mean, cars, right? I mean, right. you're doing a great job in SUVs, but um, you know, the, the Elantra and the Sonata are still part of a uh, part of your mix. Right. Um, uh, how do you explain that? Well, let's talk about that. In August, our Hyundai total car sales increased by 8%. Sonata was up 4%. Elantra car of the year, might I mention, was up. We're all jurors. So <laughs> was up, thank you, was up 20%. Our Ionic was up 21%. July retail sales for the entire lineup was up. There is still a market for sedans. There are more than 4 million sedans sold in the US. So we remain committed to sedans. With others withdrawing from this market, we see an opportunity for greater market share. And it's, it's proving itself to be true. And, yeah, yeah and, and to jump back, a little bit into the, the futuristic thinking. Mm -hmm. you, you laid out a lot of interesting scenarios, but there is also a real risk that you can spend a lot of money on things that you end up having no return on that investment. How do you decide? How do you go through this and say, okay, this is really cool, but what is going to work? Where is the market going to go? Because I, you know, the auto industry, somebody said long before there were casinos in Detroit, that Detroit already had gambling with the auto industry. They just put their chips on different vehicles. But you've got to make bets on technologies that are unproven. So how, how do you do that? So one, love the question. So let, let's talk about it because, you know, you hear a lot from, we're a global player. You hear a lot of announcements that come from different parts of the, the, the globe from, from Hyundai. As in, in my role as 
the chief product champion for North America and making sure our voice is represented in the product lineup. Key drivers for us are customer focus, and I'll get back to our North Star set by our chairman, this progress for, him, for humanity. It sounds lofty and aspirational, but all good North Stars should be lofty and aspirational. So if I talk about our strategy, I'll explain how we sort of put this in perspective. By 2025, we want to be a smart mobility solution provider. We wanna be a leader in this era of mobility. So if we take that overarching goal of progress for humanity, there are three key pillars that we look at. One is smart mobility devices. One is smart mobility services. And I'd say the third is hydrogen solutions. So let's just break that down, the devices. Battery EV, we have an Ionic 5 and a new EGMP dedicated electric platform that's gonna spawn not only the CUV um, Ionic 5, but a sedan Ionic 6 and a large SUV Ionic 7. It's got a platform that allows us to have vehicle to load and bi-directional charging, um, fast charging, 300 plus AER, BEV. We know that that's the place to go. Second, fuel cell EV. We have a Nexo SUV on the ground today. We have an Exient commercial vehicle, heavy duty truck, all powered by fuel cell. We've committed, there's an investment there because we think to this planet friendly future, use the technologies that get us there. BEV is one, fuel cell EV is one. Third, autonomous vehicles, another device. We made a joint venture with Aptiv and we have the companies called Motional, all right? And so we have opportunities there with autonomous vehicle to get to that vision for the future. Then we've set up a division, urban air mobility which could be powered by both battery EV and fuel cell EV. And so we've invested in the devices for smart mobility. That's what, how we're looking at, looking at it. BEV, fuel cell EV, autonomous vehicle, urban air mobility. To get you to that vision, I kind of described a little bit earlier. So if we look at the second part of it, there's smart mobility services. How can we help with the services to generate revenue? How can we help with the services to increase EV adoption? So we have things like for EV adoption, we want to set up a subscription service that um, pencils and works for consumers and says it allows you to try before you buy for a couple of months because I don't know if this works in my world. Because in this EV sort of world, there's some people who can afford three home chargers and three Tesla S's. <laughs> All right. So what about democratizing it for people that want to know, is this going to work for me in my daily life? So is there a way I can try this out for three months and know that, oh, yeah, there's charging here with Electrify America, there's charging at my home, or this is going to work for me. And now I make the transition. We want to be partners in making the transition for people to move to EV. So that's in services. Then how do I bring the eco-friendly life home from a service standpoint? Are there solar panels, uh, e uh, electric generator? Is there um, with Myonic 5? And then is the home charger. How do I put that in a package and make it easy for you from a service standpoint? And are there opportunities with, with revenue from mobility services? And then are there mobility services to support heavy duty commercial vehicles for f that are gonna be equipped with fuel cell EVs? So the first part was devices, the second part was services. And then the third part would be the hydrogen solutions. Our money is where we where we, are, we we talk. We've invested Nexo fuel cell, Exient. We have leading fuel cell EV technology, and we can leverage that expertise in the U.S. So we're positioning ourselves as a tech-enabled green company with this full suite of EV um, eco-focused solutions. And that's how we look at it. Instead of like making a bet on this technology or that technology, we have an aspirational goal of progress for humanity and we've divided it into the right devices, the right services, and hydrogen solutions. Does that, does that help answer that question? It does, and if I could just get a little more on one thing, where do things stand with the urban air mobility? That, that uh, got a lot of attention at CES a couple of years ago. I mean, have you made prototypes? Have you got some things flying around in secret areas that, yeah. uh, that people haven't seen? Well, I let the, there's the there's the leader for urban air mobility. It's based in D.C. And so there's a roadmap that takes us kind of to the 2028, 20, 2030 20, timeframe. 
of which they are absolutely pursuing. So they've got a good division sort of running with that. And we work with them from H HMNA from North America to see how we can, um, as they are all on that roadmap to development, what things we can have in North America. So it's, it's, it's a full investment. It's got leadership. They've got a roadmap and they're well on their way to, to producing that. So I have a question about the hydrogen part of that strategy, because I know that's something that you guys are, are betting pretty heavily on, mm -hmm. but not a lot of consumers have a lot of exposure to that. And there's not a lot of places where they can get hydrogen vehicles at this point. How do you see not just getting the technology to the point where it's usable, but getting people to get on board with the idea of hydrogen? It's taken hard enough to get them on board with the idea of EVs mm -hmm. to a certain point. How do you get them to go to a step further? And so, you know, when I think uh, Gary asked in the beginning, what's part of your day? We have these governance, governance meetings where we actually talk about how we're going to partner with um, energy players, partner with government on what we can do for both infrastructure, awareness, and increasing adoption. And also working with our dealers of maybe there's an opportunity, since many of them are selling our Nexo SUVs, to work with them to see what we can do and help support from an infrastructure standpoint from that, that perspective. So since we are based in California, we do have um, 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 some opportunities for infrastructure here in, in California. But part of those governance meetings is also to discuss how do we move it outside of California? How do we move it to the Northeast? How do we work with government to do it? How do we get incentives to do it? How do we talk to the governors in these various states to champion that? And um, as we work, you know, we like we talked about our Exient fuel cell truck, which is in Europe. So how can we bring maybe some learnings from there to share with the team here? Because as you mentioned, and we completely agree, infrastructure is key, awareness is key, and adoption is key. So we have work streams to how we can influence each of those areas. We have to do it both with EV and we have to do it with fuel cell EV now. But, and what I would say, because people are like, well, why don't you, you know, just choose one they are both going to get us to a planet-friendly future. One is further along on the journey, I would say EV, and we're committed there, but we just see this as just earlier in the journey. And so now we have to do things for awareness there, we have to do things for infrastructure there, we have to do things for adoption there. BZ, you mentioned at the top that you guys are involved in a product onslaught. So I'm bringing it back again, so I'm, I'm the less futuristic. In this bring, bring us back, bring us back. Uh, okay. so. So, so talk to us about the Santa Cruz. I mean, um, it's I, I, Jeff has driven it. I believe Nicole's driven it as well. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of people out there have not had an opportunity to even see it yet. So tell us about that. You know what it is, who it's for, and the Ionic Five, which is coming very soon. Tell mm -hmm. us about that vehicle. Okay. So let me start with the overall product on onslaught. That was your first okay. question. In this pandemic climate we launched the Elantra car of the year. You guys all know it's got an ice version and a hybrid version, 54 miles per gallon. We launched the Tucson SUV. It's also got an ice version, plug-in hybrid and hybrid version. Then, and we'll talk about it a little bit, we launched our new sport adventure vehicle, our Santa Cruz. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you kind of the evolution of that. Then we're launching I. EV based on that new platform, eGMP. It's got fast charging, it's got vehicle to load, 300 AER, 300 plus AER. And we launched the Santa Fe, plug-in hybrid, um, ATV, and obviously ICE. Then Kona N and Elantra N, and some of you guys might have had an opportunity to drive those. And then on the Genesis side, GV80, GV70 SUVs. So I have to say that because we've done a lot in this, in this pandemic year, and it's been an onslaught. And at the same time, we're ranked second for IIHS top safety pick and top safety pick plus. And if you put if you put Hyundai and Genesis together, we're tied for first place. So I mean, I had to mention that the team has worked just heroically over the last year and a half during a pandemic to to do all that. Now, to your specific question. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you have another question before I go to? Uh, um, go, go, I'm, go. I'm a little excited about these. <laughs> a little excited about these things. Can't so tell. <laughs> Can't tell at all. So our, you know, our Santa Cruz, right? It, the concept, some of you guys might have seen it, started with this like great fanfare in 2015. And it was based on the prior generation of Tucson at that time. But we wanted to launch a vehicle that um, took the best elements 
that you get from an open bed and the ride and utility of a unibody SUV, and then launch this new, we call it lifestyle, well, lifestyle category, but for today, that it would meet the customer needs in sort of an urban environment and the, for those who want to go on an adventure. And we actually asked the customers what to call it, and they told us sport adventure vehicle. You know, in this time of Instagrammable moments, you know, sport adventure vehicle. And so they said it. We thought it was a good idea. And, and, and that's the, the new segment that we were thinking about. And now, but we also saw based on the new Tucson platform that we just launched, right, it allowed us to meet the packaging and the capability and the ride and design and, and allowed us to have this bold design with a 2.5 liter all wheel drive turbo, um, open bed for surfboards, bikes, um, great infotainment and connectivity in the interior um, and really agile ride and handling experience. It's a great ride. And then it was designed by our designers here in California um, and it's built in the US. It's here now, we're just, we're really proud of it. And the demand for it is really strong. Yeah, before- Ionic I 5? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Did Ionic 5? Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, and then our <laughs> Ionic 5. Did I leave that out? <laughs> the, um, and then our Ionic 5. So again, first um, vehicle off the dedicated platform, EGMP. And the EGMP allows us to have charging where you can go from 10 to 18 to 80%, sorry, in 18 minutes. Um, it has this 300 plus um, uh, AER. Um, it allows uh, the opportunity for in the best selling segments to have a platform that um, is flexible enough to have a sedan off of it, to have a large three row SUV off of it and our CUV off of it. And it's got this unique styling um, that people are, 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 are gravitating to. And I believe it's that vehicle that can democratize EVs. And on top of it, one of the things that we wanted to make sure we have is, I think um, Nicole brought up the infrastructure, is we launched it with two years unlimited charging um, with the fast charging um, for 30 minutes. Um, unlimited charging for two years. So now we're democratizing EV, we're bringing it into to help from an infrastructure standpoint. We wanna bring in models like try before you buy EV subscription such that we can look at ways so people can say, well, this really worked for me in our, in our lives. And then we're on the EV uh, roadmap with a uh, large, SUV, uh, uh, large SUV coming and with a, uh, um, a sedan coming. And so those are big segments. It's going to be it's 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 a it's a great time, Jeff. Yeah, I, I was going to ask go back to the uh, Santa Cruz for a few minutes, and just one quick question before I get get to the other one is: Has there been any confusion between Santa Cruz, Santa Fe, with the close names? Because I noticed the first few pieces I wrote, I wrote Santa Fe and almost <laughs> said it on the air before I said Santa Cruz, uh, <laughs> but with two vehicles that are so different yet so close in name. Has that been something that's been a problem? You know, we haven't seen it as a problem, but one of the things we try to be really customer cu customer focused, right? And so um, that's one of the reasons we took the Santa Cruz to Santa Cruz when we did our our, our media drive, because it's, it's sort of the, the folks that are gonna throw their surfboards in the back of that, that still want all the connectivity in the inside, that like those Instagram moments, that that's gonna appeal to. So we haven't really had too much trouble with the Santa Fe, Santa Cruz thing, but people identify sort of that lifestyle with that vehicle. So it's been a good, good move from that perspective. And that segues into the other question I had about it is, is the buyers, is your expectation that you're going to get very few people who had had a pickup before that you're going to get unique people who are looking for a unique kind of vehicle as opposed to traditional pickup truck buyers? You know, I, I think we'll, we'll get both. Right. But what I will say is we did do a lot of research and focus on the consumers that were saying, how does this fit in my lifestyle? And maybe the traditional trucks that they've had out there in the past don't fit their lifestyle in this way. Maybe it's too big or too hard to maneuver. Maybe I don't need a bed that large for what I wanna carry it in. And maybe I want it to look really good. <laughs> and um, you have, you know, of course, I'm somewhat biased, but you have that great grill that's also associated with the Tucson with the hidden DRLs in the grill 
I mean, you see that thing when it comes behind you in the back in the rear view mirror, it is, it's striking to look at. And so there's some people that I want my truck or my sport adventure vehicle to look a certain way. I just want all the features on the inside and I don't maybe need um, the size or some of the things associated with larger traditional trucks. Nicole, you get the last one. I get the last question. My last question. So you're talking about this taking from people who maybe are traditional truck people and who are maybe, you know, not traditional truck people. Do you think this is bringing a new kind of buyer to Hyundai? Do you think these are people who are moving from, let's stick with the Santas, from a Santa Fe to a Santa Cruz or from something entirely different that are getting their first Hyundai? I do think there, there's there's many that are going to come from SUVs to this um, Santa Cruz uh, sport adventure vehicle. We actually saw that when we did our research, that it was those people that, you know, kind of like the ride associated with an SUV, but like the utility of the open bed. And this worked out great for them. And that's who we were talking to. So we think we're going to get a lot of those buyers. It's the demand for it already is just off the roof. So I'm pretty excited about it. It makes a product planner quite happy. <laughs> Well, a little busy boil. It, 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 it's clear that you're mm, moderately excited about your job, I think. Um, it's, uh, it's great to have you. And, and we're going to have to have you back because, I mean, you guys are doing so many different things in so many different segments. And, um, you know, it, it, it's almost as though, you know, we, we think about Hyundai as being a car company, but it's clear that you are, are much broader than that in terms of what your goals and tensions and and the interesting thing is you guys are delivering it's to not just talking okay. about it you guys are, are are truly getting this stuff out there so we want to thank you very much for spending this time with us and um, all the best of luck to you guys thank you so much really appreciate it thanks jeff nicole gary okay bye, -bye. bye. so we're going to take a quick break here um here from uh, sponsors that make the show possible and we'll be back with uh, jeff and nicole The world is changing at an ever-increasing pace. No matter what the mode of transportation, there is always the need for an efficient propulsion system. And that's exactly what Borg Warner has been doing since the earliest days of the automotive industry. We create innovative mobility technologies that reduce energy consumption and emissions while improving performance. Our proven track record has made us an industry leader in forward-looking propulsion solutions for combustion, hybrid, and electric vehicles. And we're back. So I, I was I was very impressed with uh, what what Honda is up to. I mean, it's just extraordinary. Her enthusiasm is absolutely contagious. It's wonderful to see somebody who is so excited about what they're doing and about what their company's doing, as opposed to just like, yeah, this is what we're building. It's like, no, we're building this. She's mm -hmm. so enthusiastic. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's almost infectious. Yeah. Right. And so, Jeff, I'm going to ask. You, I mean, you, you're a, a veteran of this industry, and um, getting old. Know, I was being more polite than that. Hey. Come on, come on. <laughs> Seasoned. Um, hey. You know, and, you know, we've all heard people at car companies talking about, about vision, about doing this, about doing that, doing the other thing. And, you know, and, and so here's a company that, I mean, you can get a fuel cell vehicle from them. You can get an electric vehicle from them. You can get a hybrid from them. You can get a plug-in hybrid from them. And, oh, by the way, you can get a performance sports car from them. Um, you know, and it wasn't so long ago that when you thought about Hyundai, you thought about, you know, uh, an economical vehicle that had so-so styling. I mean, I mean, how do you see that company in the context of what we've been familiar with for the last X number of years? Well, they, they have been on a roll lately, and this is the whole, whole conglomerate of Hyundai, Kia, and Genesis. I mean, think of the first Kia that you drove. I mean, that name K-I-A meant, was, you know, it, it, it kind of fit with, with the vehicle because <laughs> I, I drove a Spectra. And if you remember that, that was the first Kia. And I heard a jingling. And that was the sound of something on my bag in the trunk 
there was that little insulation in it, you could hear noise from the trunk to the passenger seat. To today, Kia's got some beautiful vehicles, sporty vehicles. They drive. They're, they're a lot of fun. I am driving a uh, Genesis GV70 this week, and uh, somebody stopped me just to rave about that vehicle. The interior it is drop dead gorgeous. So this is a company that has been on a roll. So when, when you get that, you get a little bit of swagger, as they say. And she she had confidence. It wasn't swagger in an arrogant way. It was, a, you know, we're confident. We've got cool products. They've been rated well by other people, by third parties. So that is the kind of thing that can give you that enthusiasm. So So it all works together. But, but I guess, Nicole, how do you see their being able to execute all this stuff and do it well? It's, it's a lot. I mean, that is a huge plan when she talked about, what did she call it, the progress for humanity. That's a pretty lofty goal for a company. Let's, let's move humanity forward collectively. Um, I think that they've managed to accomplish a lot in a very short amount of time. And like you've been saying, they've been on a roll the last few years. I think it's a matter of just keeping that momentum from them and where they've sort of divided it down into sort of parts, you know, you can't just one big thing is too much. You got to look like she said, when she was saying devices and services and hydrogen, looking at these as parts and sort of moving each part forward as you can. And maybe some parts of this plan will move forward more quickly than others. And some are going to take a little more challenge because consumers aren't ready or, you know, government regulations aren't ready. But I think it's a matter of having this, you know, okay, we want to get to here. But to get to there, we have all these little pieces. Let's chip away at each of these little pieces to keep it moving forward. And if they can continue doing what they've been doing, I think there's a, there's a good chance they could pull it off because they really have been doing phenomenally, producing some amazing vehicles, you know, the Genesis and the Hyundai line both. Um, Jeff, when you were saying about the GV70, I had one last week. I came out from dinner and there were people like peering in through the windows in the car to see what it was. So to say they're knocking it out of the park isn't isn't over overstating things right now. And, and, and just to add, note that she talked about having their North Star and a lot of this is stretch goals. This does not mean all of these things that they're doing are going to be home run successes. Nobody hits a home run every time they're at bat. That goes for baseball. That goes for the auto industry, for, for anything. So you are not going to succeed at everything, but they have got stretch goals and they're currently succeeding at a lot of different things. Yeah, that's, it's, it's, it's an interesting company. I mean, um, you know, again, the group is doing a, a whole lot, um, and, you know, I, you know, I had the GV70 as well. And, and, you know, it's like, wow, I'm glad I'm not a product planner at a different company because I have a hard <laughs> time uh, explaining why my car isn't like this one. But uh, so, I mean, so, so, all right. So let's, let's switch gears a little bit. So Jeff, you were mentioning at the top of the show, you were at uh, an event at Ford this morning in, in Dearborn where they were uh, showing the pre-production lightning. What, 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 is the, what is the vibe there? What is the sense there? Are they excited about this vehicle? Uh, well, you asked that about a car company. Is any car company going to say they're bored about a vehicle? Of course, they're <laughs> excited uh, about the vehicle. They just built a brand new plant for it. So, yeah, they showed off the plant. They're making some very, very early pre-production models of it. And they announced, we, we all knew that they were going to increase production capacity. That's been out for a couple of weeks. But uh, they're going to shoot to make 80,000 of them a year. They've added some new jobs here in the Detroit area, 450 of them, put in another $250 million. Uh, so, so obviously this is a vehicle they've got a lot of high hopes on. Now, realistically, we talk about consumers looking at that and going, wow, that's cool. Everybody is targeting these pickup trucks at commercial companies because that's where the big orders are going to be. You know, they don't have the issue with range. They don't have some of the other issues. They get green credit for it. So, you know, Ford is all in on commercial vehicles. So are a number of other automakers. And that's why you're seeing so many electric pickups. So, so in other words, just to, just to be clear on this and to, um, so you're seeing the F-150 Lightning play being one for Ford, whereby it's it's not so much about you and Nicole and me getting one as much as it is to get um, businesses and contractors and people like that to buy these vehicles. Well, there, there are two tracks for you, me, Nicole, and 
the rest of America. It's about buying it, yes, but they're running commercials for this vehicle long before it's going to be available. And, you know, I can't tell you how long it would take for you to get one if you uh, put in a reservation today. So for us, it's about Ford has got cool products. They're electric. They're leading the electric revolution. It gives them a lot to talk about. But the bread and butter for electric vehicles for the near future is going to be commercial because commercial companies, I mean, take a look at Rivian and Amazon buying 100,000 uh, Rivian vans. Well, you know, Ford wants a piece of that business as well with pickup trucks and its transit van. GM has its bright drop and its uh, Chevy Silverado electric vehicle coming out. That's where you're going to see the big numbers of purchases of these vehicles. Mm -hmm. So, Nicole, you, you were indicating that you, you see a little bit of reticence among the normal consumers when it comes to EVs and that maybe hydrogen vehicles could be a bridge too far. Um, Give us a little insight into that. Yeah, well, you know, it's it, it, when you talk to people, just regular people, not journalists who, you know, are sort of living this every day. When you talk about the fact that hydrogen vehicles even exist to a lot of people, it's like, what? They, they, they don't even know this. They think of this as some concept that, you know, one company is working on and maybe someday it's like, no, they, they're right now. You can buy one and use it if you live in the right place. And even just, you know, it, it seems so foreign to people and going back a step to an EV or to a plug-in hybrid, even there are people, there are a large segment of the population, it's not like they don't want an EV, but they just don't have the exposure to it. There is still something weird for a lot of people about the idea that you're going to plug in your car at the end of the night instead of going to a gas station. It's a very simple change. It's not that big of a deal, but in your head, it's a huge change. So I think where a lot of people are still trying to get their head wrapped around the idea of plugging in a car every night to then say, well, you're going to fuel up with hydrogen. Forget that EV thing. Put hydrogen in your car. That's like, like, wait a minute. I haven't gotten on board with just plug it in yet. Give me a second. So I don't think it's something consumers won't do. I just think for a large percentage of them, they're still wrapping their heads around plugging in to charge up a car, forget about using hydrogen. Mm -hmm. hey, Gary, let's not forget that uh, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles have been five years away for about the last two decades. <laughs> just five years. What <laughs> yeah. One of these days we'll get there. Okay, so, so back to more reality here. Um, so, so JD Power came out with its uh, appeal um, statistics this week. That's the U.S. Automotive Performance Execution and Layout Study. They talked to 110,000 people who all have 21, 2021 new vehicles, um, whether they bought or leased it. And they look at 37 attributes, things they like. Okay, so this is what consumers say they like. And Dodge came out as the winner among all of, of the brands in the mass market. Porsche came out number one in the premium segment. Is, is, is that a surprise to you, Jeff, that, that Dodge yeah. did so well? This is where all of those math classes during high school came in very, very handy. Uh, Dodge has got, do they still have the journey? I, I don't think so. But, I think it's uh, gone. I think it's gone. So you've got the Challenger, Charger, and the Durango. Uh, so, you know, you have in the Challenger and Charger two really popular vehicles among the class of people who buy them. So you would expect those people to really love those vehicles. Porsche, same thing. I spend all this money on a vehicle that I have wanted all of my life. I'm not going to complain a whole lot. So, you know, those vehicles would be particularly appealing. So as you tell the story, you got to keep that in mind. Nicole, did you, did you see anything in the results that surprised you at all? No, I, you know, I, I likewise sort of looked at the Dodge thing being at the top and 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 was at first kind of surprised, but then like Jeff said, a lot of those these 
sort of surveys and stuff, you really have to couch it in the idea of what is the car or what is the brand and who is buying that. If you have people who are just in love with that kind of car, they're probably going to be in love with it no matter what. And it's going to make it rate highly. Whereas if you get something that maybe people are buying, like, you know, have you been craving a Chevy Equinox your entire life? Probably not, maybe. So you might be a little harder on that if that doesn't live up to your expectations, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that has a lot to do with how those, how the, how things are ranked on these sorts of uh, surveys. But I, I think one, just to add seriously, one thing that we have to keep in mind with these studies is we in the media are seeing the beauty contest part of it. These studies look at a lot of things and they give car makers a lot of information about very specific components that they are tailoring in very specific ways. So that's where these studies are really important. We report on the beauty contest. Yes, Dodge is first and Fiat is no longer last because there aren't very many Fiats around. <laughs> so, you know, that those are our stories are kind of cool water cooler stories, as they say. But for the car companies, it's all of this data that they look at that really helps them refine their vehicles. You know, one of the things that I think is is, is rather fascinating about this study is is that the, the distance between the premium brands and the mass market brands is narrowing. And, you know, this, this perhaps brings us back to, say, you know, like an Elantra or a Honda Civic or... A Camry. I mean, that that these cars that are mass market vehicles are getting so much better in terms of what they're offering, whether it's the materials that are on the on the seats and, and on the um, IP, or whether it's the technology that they're providing. And you know, it's 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 almost as though you know people you know in, in fact uh, Ola Busy used the you know term democratization. You know, it, it's almost like we're having the democratization of premiumness among, you know, um, the, the car manufacturers. I think that consumers have become less tolerant of crummy cars to a point, you know, you, you might be buying something cheaper and you're not expecting leather seats and open poor wood trim on your entry level sedan, but you also want it to at least look and feel and be attractive and hold together and get your money's worth for it. And I think for that, the automakers have collectively upped their game. So even your most basic version of your basic car is so much better than it was a decade ago. I mean, vastly different. And when you look at brands like Hyundai, what they were putting out 10 or 15 years ago compared to what they're putting out today, they don't even look like the same car company. The changes have been so marked and so positive. So yeah, I definitely think that it's something that, and that's a benefit for consumers. You know, you, you're gonna get a better car than you would have five, 10 years ago, simply because they're just not making those really crummy cars. I mean, when was the last time you were in a car that was a new model year that you generally thought was absolutely horrible in every way? Like, no, there's normally something that you're like, okay, this is kind of crummy, but this is good. They're overall, they do a good job on most of the vehicles that hit the market these days. I go back to the era where your choice in seats was vinyl or velour. Right. <laughs> I, 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 I can attest to, to how things have been improved. And, and the, the other thing to think about with, you mentioned mass market versus premium. Uh, and I was chatting about this with, with somebody from a car maker that will not be named because it was about a vehicle that is yet to be released. But there are a lot of people out there who want the attributes of a luxury vehicle, but don't want to be seen as driving a luxury vehicle. So that's why you can load up an Explorer and it's as nice as an aviator while you can load up a Tahoe and it's almost as nice as, as an Escalade. Uh, you know, you can get all that you want, but you don't have to be, Oh, he drives a Cadillac. He drives a Mercedes. You know, right. you, you can say, yeah, I'm just driving a Chevy. I may have spent $80,000 on it, but it's just a Chevy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Well, so speaking of spending $80,000 on something, so Kelly Blue Book came out and said that um, the average transaction price for a new vehicle in August was $43,355, wow. which was up 10% from a year ago, up 1.6% from um, July of 2021. It's you know an all-time high in August. Um, 
I, I, I have this question, you know, the affordability is, is seems to me that, you know, we, we should be talking about attainability. I mean, how many people can afford to buy vehicles at, at that price point? Nicole, I mean, are, are you seeing, um, now I, I know that the, the availability of vehicles is way down because of the chip shortage and so on, but I mean, I mean, do, do you see consumers being able to deal with prices like those? And I think that's part of it. I think the reason prices are high is because there isn't a lot out there. So it's like, well, if you want that and the sticker says it's 42, you're going to pay 42. You know, they, they it's not like they're trying to get rid of stuff and can't move it off the lots. So that does impact that a little bit. Just overall, yeah, I think the cost going up like that does make it so some consumers, I think, that are, don't have those kinds of budgets are stuck in a spot where it's okay, I got to wait, I can't, I'm not spending for $5,000, you know, and if that's the average, you know, there's people spending 50, 60 grand on a car to get that average to 45. Mm -hmm. um, I think it makes it tough for those consumers. And I think those people are going to find themselves waiting, which in some ways might be more of a challenge, because if your budget is a little bit you know, larger and you're waiting and waiting because you have something that you need to replace. If you have to replace it, okay, you bite the bullet and you do it. If your budget isn't that large and you have to replace it, you don't have as many options. And I think it does get to a point where it prices people out of being able to get a new car. Jeff, are you seeing that? Yeah. Well, long ago, uh, I went to a GM presentation and I mean, this was the old GM, even pre-bankruptcy where they were saying that half of the market doesn't even look at new cars. I mean, people, many, many people have been pushed out of the new car market and are in the used car market. So, you know, you, 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 the auto industry is now fighting for people who are upper middle class and above. There is very little on the entry level because car makers really can't make much of a profit. I mean, even when you're talking about an Elantra, it, you know, we, we were laughing a few minutes ago and joking about cheap cars that didn't have the world's best quality. But back in that era, people with lower incomes could afford those vehicles, but car makers couldn't make money off of those vehicles. So they're concentrating on things on the higher end that, that they do make money on. I mean, if, if somebody would buy, uh, you know, 200,000, the equivalent of a model T today, low cost everyday vehicle and the car companies could make a lot of money on it, they'd make those. But right now they make the money on putting more leather and more chrome on an F-150 and uh, putting a high-end audio system on a Yukon. <laughs> remember, remember all of the hype around the Tata Nano, even in emerging markets, it was a great idea, basic car for people who couldn't afford it. And people decided that car's too cheap. I don't want it. Right. It's because everybody's aspirational and they, they yeah. want to, you know, get, you know, if you see that, you know, your car looks like, eh, and you see somebody has a car that looks really sweet, your eh isn't going to make it, I think. Um, Nobody really wants the eh car. Everybody wants the wow car, but yeah, there's people, right. there's a need for the eh car out there. <laughs> there. There is a need, but there are so many, cars last so long, there are a lot of very nice, you know, four and five year old vehicles that that are in great shape and, and run well. So I think there are a lot of people out there who would rather have a five year old vehicle with a lot of the bells and whistles than something brand new stripped down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if, if we've even seen used car prices just skyrocket during this period as well. So um, there are a lot of oddities happening out there too. You've got everything's off kilter right now. <laughs> well, you, you, you've got to see, you know, what the historic trend has been. Yeah. The, the prices are up, but you know, there's a, there's a wide, wide range of, of used vehicles out there. Mm -hmm. um, shifting gears a little bit here. Um, so, Presently, you know, Congress is is talking about legislation that would affect EV purchasing, and so you know they're they're talking about um, seventy five hundred dollar point of sale to people who buy an electric vehicle, and if that electric vehicle is produced in a union facility, they get another four thousand five hundred dollars, and if that vehicle has a battery that is built in the United States that would be another 500 bucks. Now we, we've seen Toyota and Honda saying, wait a minute, we employ a whole lot of people in the United States. What about us? What about the people who buy our vehicles? 
Um, do you guys have any insights into this? Well, I think, I mean, I get the idea behind it uh, that they're trying to, you know, encourage people to be buying EVs and especially, you know, encouraging to buy EVs that were produced entirely in certain environments within the United States, like with the battery that are produced here. I, but I don't, I don't necessarily think that it's a good thing. Like, I, it, is it better to do that? Or is it better to just say, we're just going to up the number for all EVs instead of making it 75, make it whatever, 95. And then across the board, people have access to whatever EV it is they want, and they're going to get that discount. I, I, I get the idea behind it, but I don't know that it's, it, you know, you're penalizing an automaker just because they happen to be Honda or, you know, they're, they're not, they're not an American car company. And I, I don't know that that's a good thing. I'm covering the story, so I've got to be very careful about what I say, but it will be interesting to watch as it makes its way through Congress, because obviously you have two very strong competing sides on this. You've got uh, people in union states who certainly want to support the UAW, people in states that uh, have got transplant factories in there and they want to make sure those vehicles are purchased. It, it, it's kind of a miniature version of what we saw during the uh, congressional bailout hearing. So mm -hmm. you, you'll, you'll see the fight back and forth. And let us not forget that this is also part of a larger bill that remains very controversial in a Senate that is very evenly divided. So it will be interesting to see what the final version is. There were a lot of passionate arguments about it this week, but there's a lot more to go. So, I mean, just, just in general, do you think that tax incentives will be sufficient to really kickstart EV acceptance in the United States? Either of you? No, I don't think that. I mean, it, it it helps, and I think it helps people maybe who are on the fence. And uh, but I think it takes it. There's there's more than just the money to get people into EVs. There's also the you know the acceptance of of going with an EV mentally. You know, making that switch and having the infrastructure and feeling like you can live with it. So I think that the money might help some people who are not quite sure if they can budget or debating. But I don't think that's enough to make them like wholesale. Everybody says, sure, I'm all in. Give me an EV. I, I don't think it's an, an all in kind of thing. It, it's something that I would imagine adds to the overall package. But if the EV is something that is, is really aspirational, take a look at Tesla. They ran out of credits a while ago. And last I looked, they were still selling a lot of vehicles. Mm -hmm. So to, to, to the, the point of Tesla, which of course we have to bring up Tesla on every show, because if we didn't bring up Tesla, there'd be something wrong with us. But, um, <laughs> you know, one of the things that occurred to me is, is that, okay, so um, when Ford hired Doug Field from Apple last week or the week before, everyone starts talking about the Apple car again, okay? And, you know, it occurs to me that, you know, so there's, there's, there's possibly an Apple car Sony's got the Vision S that they're fooling around with. Um, and I mean, do people buy, would people buy these things? They're not from car companies. You know, we, we have this notion of, you know, there's something called a car company and then there's something called something else. And, you know, so if people would buy an Apple car, if people would buy a Sony car, if people are buying Teslas, what does this say about the value of traditional car companies? I, I mean, I think that the value of, of a company, whether it's a car company or a, I guess you call it Apple a tech company, the, the value of the brand is still there. If they can expand into something that, you know, if there's an Apple car and people like Apple and they feel like the what they get with their Apple products is going to translate into their car. I don't think it negates or, or, or delegitimizes de de the power of another brand like a Dodge or a Jeep or whatever. But I think it's just another way for those companies to expand their brand. I think it just it gives a little more competition. Um, you know, you're, you're adding some other companies into your list of automakers. But I don't think I think it's just a different way to look at the brand. I you know my. The doubting part of me says that Apple probably will continue to look at this and probably not make a vehicle just because it is so expensive and there there is so much technology that uh, 
they do so well that why not just do the technology and sell it to somebody who's making a car? But but I've been wrong before. I mean, if we were talking in 2005 that, you know, Apple's going to make a phone and compete with <laughs> Motorola and Samsung right? and all of these giants, come on, you got to be crazy. But, you know, there we learned there was a lot of reinvention to do with the phone. Is there that much reinvention for the car? Well, I don't think so, but maybe there's somebody who's a lot smarter than me that does. Hmm. Yeah, I'm just I'm just thinking that okay, if if we take Apple out of this and you look at companies like Lucid or even you look at companies like Fisker, okay? One is a completely new company, one has roots that go back a few years, right? And and I just look at this and I say to myself, okay, so for years and years and years and years, there were always just the same car companies that were involved. And people bought, you know, these very expensive things, you know, every transaction price, 43,355 bucks, right? You're putting a lot of money into this. And are is is there going to be a willingness for people to say, you know what, I'm buying one from this non-traditional vendor, even though it, you know, it, it costs what a, you know, small house costs. <laughs> and, uh, I think and, and, there's and, and, people who will. I think some people will. I think a large number of people are going to say, no way am I just going to, you know, spend, like you said, the cost of a house as a gamble on an Apple car. But then there's the, you know, once upon a time buying a Tesla was sort of the same gamble, right? Like I'm not mm -hmm. buying from this Tesla dude. I don't know what this is all about. You know, no way I'm not, I'm not doing it. And now people buy them all the time. Um, that, you know, there's going to be people who look at Apple and I don't necessarily think they're going to, you know, make a car, but let's use them and say, Sure, I want the first Apple car, even if it turns out to be an atro atrocious mistake. I want the first Apple car. So there will be people who will, you know, do that. Um, and whether they, once they get them, they're actually halfway decent. That'll let you know whether people will keep getting them. You know, those first, those early adopters that will take the plunge and do it. Mm -hmm. What's fascinating about this industry is being able to watch without having to predict, because. You know, th things take so many different roads. Uh, Tim Higgins, who wrote the excellent book on Apple, when, when I interviewed him, he told me that when he started writing this book, he wanted to chronicle the failure and demise of, I said Apple, I meant Tesla. Tesla. He, he wanted to chronicle the failure and demise of Tesla, and instead he ended up chronicling the comeback. So <laughs> it, it, it's interesting how something looks so obvious one day and it looks another way uh, another day we all have our preconceived ideas of what we think might happen but I, as, as somebody seasoned as, as you said I, I have seen a lot of things uh, that were going to happen that didn't happen again we talked about those uh, fuel cells that are always five years away uh, same thing with a number of other things so I'm not going to be the guy who says it's not going to work because it's going to come back in my face but I'm not going to be the guy who makes bets on it it's just cool to have a front row seat Mm -hmm. All right. So with that, I'm going to wrap the show. I promised you guys we'd be done at four. We're pretty close to four. So um, Nicole, thanks for uh, joining us today. And where can people find your stuff? Um, I freelance for a lot of different outlets. You can find me on True Car and Auto by Tell. Uh, those are probably the best places to look for me. Okay. Thank you. And, and Jeff, WWJ, oh, well, News I, Radio 95. AM Radio 9. 50, 50,000 kilowatts out of Detroit, CBS Radio Network, and of course, WWJNewsRadio.com. Perfect. So thanks everyone for joining us, and uh, John will be back next week, and we'll be doing another show. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, solutions for your journey, and by Borg Warner propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy-efficient world. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv.